Today's podcast has been brought to you by Emmanuel's Music Ministry. We are so grateful for Emmanuel's Music Ministry as we'll be talking today about music and our faith uh, from our director, Jenny Lobbs, who heads up our entire music ministry of choirs, adult, children, handbell, and our praise team led by Bob Rising and crew. Mm-hmm. And Jenny puts up with us in worship meetings, which yeah. she probably wants us to just leave at times. Uh-huh. We come up with crazy, crazy uh, songs and things to sing. And we just want the hamburger tune. <laughs> the hamburger. Yeah. So, yeah, but we are truly grateful for Jenny and for Bob and all of our musicians in the choirs and handbells and all those different things. Mm-hmm. And they just make our worship even more special. Yeah. Thanks to be to God for our music ministry. Hey, everybody. Welcome to PD and P-Dubs Unscripted. It is uh, the podcast for Monday, April 25th, and we are talking about faith intersections today, and uh, hope you're having a great day. Uh, PD is here with us. How's it going, PD? Not good. Not good. Oh, he's in a foul mood. You know, just changing it up from our conversation yeah. on the last podcast. You're, you're not too convincing, though. I know. Well, let's try that again, okay? Give us, give us another, like, you know, really okay. get into the... Mojo no. here, okay? Okay. All right. Hey, everybody. Pass, uh, P, P Dub's here. Um, uh, PD, how you doing today? Not good. <laughs> What's going on? Why are you not good? You... The beloved White Sox lost 5-1 to one to the Mariners on recording day. Oh, that's awful. No. Oh, I'm so sorry to hear Four that. Four-game win streak over. Over. Season over. <laughs> Just curses everything. Oh, Season's man. Season's cursed. You've really gone to the tank here. Um, this is not the Easter joy that I was expecting from you. Easter's a week gone, you know, <laughs> talking about doubting Thomas yesterday. We'll talk about him more on Wednesday. <laughs> All right, White Sox fans, you got you to rally around your guy here. He needs a little help. He's a little down in the dumps. Hopefully by April 25th when this comes out, they won't lose a game from now until then. Oh, I see, like uh, reverse psychology Something. and stuff like that. You know? Well, um, so we were kicking around today, like, what do we talk about? Faith intersections and... Uh, well, we kind of collaborated and came up with something we hope you're interested in. Um, you know, oftentimes we look at Hollywood, we look at uh, sports and things like that. And so today we were picking a couple of our favorite um, musical artists and their songs and trying to find something that may have some kind of faith I- intersection right. to it. How it connects to faith or just something in our faith life, even if that wasn't maybe the intended purposes exactly. of the said song. Yeah, exactly. And so um, th- that's the one caveat. We're not like saying, oh, this song is, you know, to help our faith. But uh, a lot of times in music, as you find out a lot, PD, is uh, that there's a lot of overtones there that talk about how people struggle in not only in their life, but the element of faith in and so forth in that struggle. So... Uh, there has a sense of reality in there to right. to us, and I think that's what draws like me and probably a lot of people to music is that it's real life people writing about real life emotions, mm-hmm. uh, much like the Psalms, where it's David or the other psalmist just sharing their thoughts about life because of something they've experienced. Mm-hmm. And so that's why I think we can all relate to music to some extent. Not that we could say the exact same connection point to what that singer or musician is writing about, but we can understand the emotions that they're sharing about. It's funny you say that about the emotions of the Psalms, and I recall back reading uh, some writer about the Psalms who said that there's various orientations in the Psalms, like a Psalm writer might be in a state of disorientation, like they're kind of, their life is spinning out of control. Um, Oh, I should back up. There's a state of orientation. This is where they're at right now. This is the circumstance that they're in. It's kind of precarious. They don't know what to make of it. And then a state of disorientation where they find like all of a sudden their life is really going down, spinning out of control. They don't know what to do. So in the Psalms, they wind up crying out to God. And then there's a uh, a portion called reorientation where it's like almost out of the blue in the Psalm. The Psalm writer goes from like spinning out of control to praising God. And this is amazing. My life is great. God has rescued me. He's my Lord. And they don't even know how that happened, but they attribute it to God alone, not to them, to their own self. So in the same way with a lot of the lyrics of musicians, you know, you kind of sense some 
here's our orientation. Oh, now my life is spinning out of control, and and now I'm reoriented to something. You know that inner turmoil almost. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so we have a couple songs. Uh, PD and I have picked, and uh, one is from. I'll call it my my generation or my genre when uh, oh, I was coming out of college and uh, PD. You know he's he's a really interesting character musically. So uh, he's picking he's Mister Retro. I think I don't know what year your song came out. Do you uh, want to lead off with yours first? Sure. I mean, I was looking. Oh man, this will make you probably feel old, but we'll get to it when we get to your song. Okay. But yeah, let me look up. I know what album it's off of, but I can't remember. It's kind of one of the lesser known, but mm-hmm. al- or not lesser known, but an album I don't listen to. So like the band I'm using is Pearl Jam. Maybe not a surprise to many people that have heard me talk because yeah. I love you love them. I do love Pearl Jam, and so and so I'm looking at a song called Present Tense off their album No Code, which like I said, it isn't maybe one of my most favorites, but it came out in 1996. Oh, right. So this was after, this is their fourth album, because 10 versus Vitalogy, which if I listen to a Pearl Jam album besides live concerts, it's usually one of those three. Mm. After that, it's hit or miss what I listen to. Mm -hmm. And I almost forgot about this song, Present Tense, until 2020 during COVID, because everybody in 2020 during COVID was watching The Last Dance about the Chicago Bulls. Oh, right. And at the end montage they played the song present tense, like the instrumental part, because Dennis Rodman was actually good friends with Pearl Jam. I do remember that. And so that's why I'm like, when I heard it, I'm like, oh, this is a Pearl Jam song. What? I can't think what song it is. So I look, I'm like, oh, it's present tense. Mm-hmm. And so I think it's the lyrics that we can all relate to. I'm not going to read them all, but kind of around the chorus, it goes, uh, you can spend your time alone, redigesting past regrets, oh, or you can t- come to terms and realize you're the only one who can forgive yourself. Oh, yeah. Makes much more sense to live in the present tense. Mm-hmm. And, you know, when I hear those lyrics and think about that, I and mean, this is something I've used in my elective here, Faith and Pop Culture, with our middle school students, how many of us can relate to you spend your time alone redigesting past regrets? A lot of people. Right. I mean, uh, every one of us, right? We we think about what we've done wrong in the past, and we we just it comes back at us. Right. So that's why I was like, you know, I can relate to that. I think back to times like I've shared times like I can go back to more times when I've messed up, maybe leading a church, whether on vicarage or as a pastor, mm-hmm. than maybe the more positive times. Like yeah. I've shared how in the past, I remember in my vicarage congregation, I forgot an entire paragraph of a sermon because I was preaching off an outline. Okay. That would have been 2009, 2010. Uh-huh. Who remembers that from that church in Oklahoma? <laughs> probably nobody. Probably nobody. And probably nobody knew that because they didn't see my manuscript. Yep, yep, for sure. Or when I was at my home congregation and forgot to have everybody stand for the gospel. Mm. And I think I was at college or maybe in some, I can't remember. Mm-hmm. But who remembers that? Right. I still do that. So I can so I can totally get where Eddie Vedder's coming from, the singer and lyricist for Pearl Jam. And then... You know, it goes on to say, you, or you can come to terms and realize. Mm. And then he says, you are the only one who can forgive yourself. And there's some truth to that, mm-hmm. but there's also another person that can forgives us, and that's God. Yep, yep. But think of like, you've heard the term, oh, I'm harder on myself than anyone else. Right. And that's like, you're the only one who can forgive yourself. A, a lot of people get to that, and they're like, well, yeah, but I can't. Because right. what I did, I can't like. Um, I'm I'm too hard on myself. I should never have done that, and they can't can't get past it. Right. So, yeah, a lot of people deal with that uh, not being able to forgive yourself. But you're right. That's that's the beauty of our faith, and that something outside of us, uh, a presence in our Lord, uh, comes outside of us and forgives us, and has a whole different view on us than ourselves who are stuck in this uh, state of unforgiving ourselves from regrets. Right. And so that's the hard thing. Is that actually forgiving one another? I'm just trying to look up a quote here uh, with Eddie Vedder. I'm trying to find that. Uh, As I'm looking that up, we'll talk to you a little bit about the next point when he's like, it makes much more sense to live in the present Mm -hmm, tense. mm -hmm. And it's like, 
It really does because we can't change what happened in the past. Mm -hmm. And can we really change what happens in the future? Yeah. Uh, And I think we kind of talked about that on an earlier podcast. Yeah, you know, uh, uh, we can't change the past. The present is a a gift and uh, something about the future. There's there's a whole uh, (laughs) phrase about that, but you got to live in the present. Right. Because you can't change the past. Are you thinking about the saying that's like, yesterday's history, tomorrow's a mystery, today's a present? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the one. But yeah, here's the quote that I was looking for. Eddie Vedder said about this song, I think there's a little self-examination in those songs, or maybe about this album, something that a lot of my friends are going through, too, as they approach 30. Mm. So kind of an interesting, like... Yeah, and you think of that age of life, that period of time, people are, you know, have, you'd think, uh, launched into their own life as an adult, so they're kind of just launching and establishing uh, work, career, uh, maybe long-term relationship with someone, living on their own. And so it's a precarious thing, and you b- begin to compare a lot with your contemporaries. And so when you hit the age of 30, it's like your first check back in your life, like, okay, uh, where am I in relation right. to everyone around me? And so there could be a lot of regrets going on. There. Right, and I was just looking up age-wise here, so like, Eddie Vedder was born in 1964. This mm-hmm. album came out in 96, so recording in 95 and 96. So roughly about 31, 32. So right around that age of where you are looking maybe back and reflecting upon mm-hmm. those past mistakes. I remember when my brothers turned 30, it was like a big deal to them, you know? And I'm like, what are you talking about? You're 30, you know? Right. But it was like a landmark. It was like the first landmark thing, like... You know, I better have my stuff together and be headed out to the future. And if I haven't done it by 30, something's wrong, right. you know. And I don't and, know if that mindset still exists well, nowadays. Well, now I think it is, it's shifted a little bit because it used to be kind of like your 20s. You have everything figured out in your mm-hmm. life by like your 20, 21. Like go to like the generation prior to you, I would say like married by 18, 19. Yeah, yeah. And you have your life settled. And, mm-hmm. you know, you slowly see those things being pushed off. And now it's... Like 30 is that new 20. Like, I need to have my life figured out by 30 Mm -hmm. because I'm still trying to find out who I am in my 20s, which is crazy to the older generations because it's like by the time I was 21, 22, I was in my profession. Yeah. And that's what I did till I retired. Mm -hmm. And now it's like, well, I'm trying to figure out. And that's why they say like the marriage age has increased, I think, to 27, 28. That makes sense. Around there, where it's like, I don't want my spouse to change who i'm gonna be i want to figure out who i am before i get married Mm -hmm. and it's it's kind of a weird mindset i think a little bit it's like don't you want to grow together with somebody exactly but i think people want to be established by that age and then say okay now i can consider living my life with someone else who also is established you know and a lot of it unfortunately deals with the monetary things like you know i i'm i've i'm kind of uh peaking in my career and I know the things I like. I've got, you know, a house or whatever. And so all of the unknowns are already answered in their right. mind. And so you have that shift of, like, where the mentality is. And I think some of it's brought about by, like, our brain development, which has kind of taken now into the mid-20s. Because think about now, like, if you say somebody's an adult at 18, mm-hmm. you might not think they're an adult, but 50 years ago, 18, you were an adult and you yeah. were more established. And now... when I would say in general, I'm not trying to bash yeah. younger people. It's just the mindset is different. Different mindset, and the brain doesn't fully develop until 25. Mm-hmm. So you see, as they're talking about it, which I've mentioned in a previous one, the stage called emerging adulthood, mm-hmm. that, that 18 to 25, that you're emerging into becoming an adult instead of 18, you're an adult. Right, right. But it, no matter uh, what time period, you know, I think of people in my life, you know, people who are much older than me and people who are younger than me, you know, that struggle of looking back at the past and saying, oh, I've, I've not done really well here, and there's this regret. And uh, where they find some sense of peace is like what he's saying here is to, all right, I'm just going to live in the present and just tackle what's in front of me. You know, and that that's kind of a break off from the past that might, you know, you might be shackled in. And maybe right. that's what he's referring to. You right. Know, like this is his mindset. It makes so much more sense 
So just live in the present. But it's so hard to do that. And, mm-hmm. you know, and I don't think there's any Christian overtones in this because I know they're not Christians from converse, what I've heard with interviews. I mean, I know they're very socially minded for social injustice. But it kind of to wrap up here, because I don't want to make sure we get time for your song and not yeah. all in this, is I was, you know, when I've done this with our my faith and pop culture class, we talk, I'll bring up 1 John 4, 9, which says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us all of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Mm. Yeah, for sure. That's uh, that's it right there. And uh, so the regret is gone. Uh, you know, the Lord does not have regrets over us. He forgives us. He loves us. And uh, so we should we should delight in that forgiveness. Right. And so if God can forgive us... Certainly we, we can. Sh- we should, and like he cleanses us so it's no longer there. Yeah. And then one other verse is Isaiah 41.10, Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you up, or I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that reminder of like, you know, as we live in the present day, this is who's with us. He's holding us with his right hand. Yeah, and he's going to help us. Yeah, I mean, that whole section there where it breaks down of what God will do, you know, he's going to help us. He's going to hold us up and hold us by his mighty right hand. Yeah, good stuff, man. I, I um, you know, the next couple of verses there, after he talks about maybe it makes more sense to live in the present tense. Well, then he goes into like the future or how life ends, right? You know, and I think, wow, that was a quick shift. And uh, so he goes, "Have you ever any ideas on how this life ends? Checked your hands and studied the lines. Have you the belief that the road ahead ascends off into the light?" So it sounds like he's talking a little bit about uh-huh. questioning. Is there really eternal life in heaven right. ahead of us? You know, so it's really interesting where he takes it. Right. So yeah. So it's like I said, it is a song I enjoy by a band I love. Not maybe one of my most favorite, but it is a great s- song and great mm-hmm. band in my opinion. Yeah, I like Pearl Jam. I I wish I knew more about them. I probably know more of the popular songs than anything. Mm-hmm. But uh, so one of my favorite ones that I wanted to share today was uh, U2 is uh, one of my favorite bands, especially, you know, coming out of college and high school and college. I had an opportunity to go see U2 play at what was then the Rosemont Horizon in 1987 when they brought out the Joshua Tree album. And that was really and a most amazing concert, one of that I've ever been to. Yeah, I mean, that would be a great song, al- or great concert to see. And you know, talking about you know, make you feel old. So yeah, I was looking at when it came out, the album in '87. Uh huh. So I was two going on three when this <laughs> album came out. But it is a really great album. Like every like you know, when I listen to it, I'm like, man. The next song, I'm like every song is a banger on this album. Yeah, it sure is. It just keeps rolling and rolling. And the one that I've I've always loved this song is I still haven't found what I'm looking for. And, you know, maybe that's where I was in my 20s. You know, I had an idea of where I was headed, you know, career-wise. I got my degree in accounting or that's what I was working for. Well, by 1987, I had graduated. And uh, so... Um, but I was like, there's there's got to be more to life than this. You know, and I was thinking worldly mm-hmm. thinking... And uh, so I would find myself really connecting with this song. Um, You know, like many of you, I would drive in my car, windows down, hit the highway, and I'd play my favorite tunes. And I'd be, you know, singing out loud, you know, and I still haven't found what I'm looking for. Kind of became an anthem, you know, because in your early 20s, like we had talked about, you're, you're searching, you're trying to find, you're trying to get that niche, you're trying to hit your lane. And um, so that that's kind of where it um, connected with me. But um, this particular song came out again in the Rattle and Hum album a few years later, and I, I don't know the, the date of that, and you probably get on that real good. I can look that up for you real quick. But they brought in a choir, a gospel choir. It came out in 1988. 1988, Rattle and Hum. So... Um, they brought in this gospel choir from Harlem, uh, Harlem Church, and uh, they did a performance in Madison Square Garden. And uh, man, it just really just lifts this song to newer heights. And uh, in some of the lyrics, there is some kind of overtones with regard to faith or, you know, struggling with faith. And, uh, you know, here 
you know, Bono talks, I've climbed the highest mountains, I've run through the fields only to be with you, only to be with you. I've run, I've crawled, I've scaled the city walls only to be with you, but I still haven't found what I'm looking for. And so here is that eternal, like, searching. I've been all around the world. I've been here, I've been there, uh, and I want to be with you, but I still haven't found what I'm looking for. And that really just in this moment popped into one of my favorite psalms, Psalm 139. It starts, O Lord, you have searched me and you've known me. You know my rising up, my lying down. You're acquainted with all my ways. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you're there. If I go to Sheol, you're there. If I dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there, uh, your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. And so here, it's kind of that same thing. You know, he's like, I've been here, I've been there, but it's the opposite. I've, I've tried to find you, only to be with you, but I can't find you. Um, and then he uh, he kind of gets into like, almost like uh, the Apostle Paul. He goes, I've spoke with the tongue of angels. And I'm thinking, you know, uh, 1 Corinthians 13, you know, I could speak in uh, the tongue of angels, but if I have, if I do not have love, I'm like a resounding gong, you know? Mm. And uh, he goes, and I've held the hand of the devil. Um, it was warm in the night. It was cold as stone, but I still haven't found what I'm looking for. And then this is where on the rattle and hum version with the gospel choir comes in. It's almost creedal in nature. Well, actually, it's Lord's, Lord's Prayer. Uh, I believe in the kingdom come, you know, and then all the colors that bleed into one. Um, you know, many nations perhaps right. bleeding into one, bleed into one, but, but yes, I'm still running. So he's still moving, Sorry. searching, moving, okay. and then gets down to, uh, where it really ties into me, a uh, Christ centered thing. You broke the bonds, you loosed the chains, you carried the cross of my shame of my shame. And then, you know, when Jesus said, uh, to Mary, do you believe this? And she said, yes, Lord, I believe. And here he says, you know, I believe it. And so for Bono, I thought, okay, here is where maybe in the song he found it. Right. You know, he found what he was looking for. Um, so maybe in life, and I, and I kind of looked up the meaning behind this, it, he does say that it's a song of like disappointment and things like that and a, an eternal searching. Um, but in the lyrics uh, right here, it's so evident that you would think, okay, he found it. But then the song ends four times repetition, but I still haven't found what I'm looking wow. for. And you're like, oh, man, you're, you're right there. But it is a glorious version, that one on Rattle and Home oh, with that, that choir. Yeah, yeah. It really just lifts the roof off of wherever the recording studio. I think they recorded it in a church, that Harlem church. Okay. And uh, uh, I got some some thoughts here. Well, it looks on like that. it. I think it's live. It says live from at Madison Square Garden for that one. Yeah. Okay. Here, um, here on that section where it gets where I was saying it goes. I believe in the kingdom. Uh, Bono has written a variety of spiritual songs. This one makes distinct references to Jesus, as I said, and uh, he is acknowledging salvation. And yet he still hasn't found what he's looking for. This need for deeper fulfillment and futile search corresponds to a setback in the cycle of faith. The setback of inferiority is followed by confusion. Rather than getting back onto the path toward a better faith, another setback occurs. The frustration of the first setback grows, causing confusion and a distorted perspective. I think that's like a lot of what people are struggling with like they right. want to believe and they they like they know Jesus did this for them and i yes they believe it but it's almost that the reality of their struggle overtakes that belief right. and is t too powerful and it right. distorts their view like it well, says well to me as you're saying that is like you know we picked two songs that i think correlate pretty well with one mm -hmm. another because that whole idea of forgiving ourselves we might know that god has forgiven us yep but we still have trouble living in that forgiveness and maybe forgiving ourselves like the pearl jam song talks about right it's and like we planned these two songs I, together i know it's amazing and like who's the author of you know confusion and distorted perspectives devil is, yeah so he's in the middle of this you know he's the one who 
who's got you by the chains uh, as well as your own sinfulness. And and here he he says it in the song, you loose the chains, you set me free. And it's almost like people want to gravitate back to what's familiar. Like, oh, I know what that feels like to be bonded and chained and right. confused. And so it's almost like the Satan's power to distort makes us feel almost comfortable in that state where we feel held back and searching and searching and searching. But Jesus says, boom, I've, I've done it. You know, like, right. here I am. It's over. It's yeah, completed. Exactly. You know, we hear on Good Friday, it is finished. Mm-hmm. It is it is complete. It is done. To telestai. Yeah, there's a good Greek word. Look, we got some Greek in here today. <laughs> I'm going home. I completed my day saying yeah. the Greek word on this podcast. Right, right. So anyway, um, this hey, this has been really fun, kind of checking out some of our our favorite artists and uh, just seeing how it intersects with faith, and um, that's the beauty of uh, you know music in our lives. Um, we really remember lyrics and the, almost like instantaneously when we hear the tune. That's why right. I love that show years ago. Maybe you were too too young. Uh, I can name that tune. People would say, I can name that tune in five notes, four notes, three notes. Name that tune. And then like you'd hear the notes and they could. It's like amazing. See, I used to be okay at like at least for the bands I listened to, like hearing the first maybe five, ten seconds of a song be like, oh, that's that band. Yeah. Because of the way the guitars are. Or uh-huh. Once you hear the singer, that's a little more obvious. Mm-hmm. Unless, you know, nowadays, and I don't know if you're familiar, you know, we talked about Led Zeppelin before, but if you hear this band Greta Van Fleet, no, no. Uh, I'll have to play some after this and see like how close he actually sounds to Robert Plant and Led Zeppelin. Mm. Okay. Yeah. So. I look forward to hearing that. But the same goes with our, our own um, Christian songs, our, our, our hymnody. That's right. where it's beautiful. You can pick up, like, you know, we can hear, as soon as you hear a mighty fortress, mm-hmm. you know exactly what's coming. Exactly. And uh, for all the saints, there are certain songs. As soon as you hear it, yeah, I know that my redeemer lives. You know, bang, there it is. And uh, yeah, what of this? What of that? Oh, uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's a favorite here. Uh, <laughs> but as you know, as we heard on Christmas, you know, crown him with many crowns. As crown soon as you hear him, that, yes. mm-hmm. and even with that, like, because songs that something with the hymnody or melody helps us to memorize things. Like, I know I've seen people talk about. It. I can't remember if it's in the Lutheran Study Bible or where I saw it. Where Philippians 2, I think, verses 5 through 11, some say they think that was set to a hymn, talking about Jesus, or like because that would have been easy to memorize and what it symbolizes, gotcha. what Paul's writing about there in Philippians 2. Very interesting. I've never heard of that. Yeah. Well, so just in the same way that we are so tuned in musically to secular music, and, and as we look through lyrics, we can see the struggle, uh, our own hymnody, our Christian music is just the opposite in terms of, yes, we recognize it right away, but it is strengthening, it's fortifying, and it's uh, reassuring. Like, yes, I may have these feelings and these doubts, but one thing's for sure is God's love for me and his power and his authority over sin, Satan, and the, and the devil. And so um, that's that's a great part of our faith is sure. the songs we sing. Right. So yeah, so thank you everybody for tuning in today for another episode of PD and P-Dubs Unscripted and hope you are blessed by this conversation and God's blessings. Mm-hmm.